And now I'd like you, if you could, please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Because now it is time for us to continue our focus and our theme on New Year and New You. Uh, this is still January, right? This week, next week. It is the perfect month for us to continue putting some new goals and, and new plans in place to make some course corrections, if you will. Uh, we know what course corrections are, right? Those little adjustments that we need to make when we're on our journey to get us back on track to where we really need to go. Uh, let me give you a real life example this morning. I might have told you some of this story before, but someone needs to hear this today. Okay, when Carrie and I first got married, uh, we went on our honeymoon trip to the mountains of Colorado. Uh, we both love camping, and uh, my grandparents were, were kind enough to loan us not only their, their camper, but also to take it up into the mountains for us and park it right by a lake overlooking this beautiful mountain vista, this mountain view. It was gorgeous. It was right in front of the tallest mountain in Colorado, Mount Elbert. And I think I've got a picture of that here for you. So there it is, Mount Elbert, is, as seen from Turquoise Lake. Mount Elbert, highest mountain, 14,439 feet above sea level, highest mountain in Colorado. And again, Turquoise Lake, just beautiful. So you guys, can you, can you see why a guy who was born in Colorado would, uh, would see this as an inviting spot for their honeymoon or just for any kind of, kind of trip, right? So it, was, it was just beautiful. You guys, we woke up to this scene every morning. We went fishing in that lake. We got to see the sun come up over that mountain range every single day. It was absolutely stunning. And every day we were there, we'd step out of our camper and I'd see that mountain off in the distance and it was just calling to me. Come, climb me. Come, climb me. So, you know, even though it, it hadn't been on our, uh, our honeymoon itinerary anywhere, I, I somehow convinced Carrie to climb Mount Elbert with me. So, you know, we did what I'm sure every uh, young couple did at that time. You know, we, we looked at the we pulled out the map. And you guys, you remember paper maps, you know, that like unfold about 20 times. Uh, we didn't have no cell phones back then. Okay, no GPS, none of that stuff. So we got out the paper map and we found the road that got us closest to the peak of Mount Elbert. And then we drove around the little roads, you know, for quite a long time till we got to that spot. We could see, okay, this is as closest as we can get by road to the peak. So this is where we're going to start. So we pulled off the road, parked the car, and we just started climbing up, you know, the side of the hill. Um, so there's something, a couple of things you need to know about mount, mountain climbing if you've never done it before, okay? I'm going I'm to do this in countdown style, going from top backwards, okay? Number two, it's, it's not as simple as climbing a tree. Okay, here's what I mean by that. When you, when you climb to the tree, most of the time when you're climbing most trees, you can see the top of the tree pretty much the whole time you're climbing, right? I mean, there are some trees that get a little branchy and you got to work your way around. But if you stay close to the trunk, to the base of the tree, and work your way up that way, you're in good shape. Guess what? It's not that easy with a mountain. Um, see, when we parked the car... We couldn't see Mount Elbert at all because there were several, you know, smaller hills and probably even a smaller mountain between us and Mount Elbert, all right? So th we had no idea where we were going. And, and we worked our way up that mountainside and then down, you know, a couple valleys and then back up. And we had to keep making these course corrections because we'd have to, we'd hit these rock outcroppings and stuff that we had to work our way around and then trees and then a little ravine as like, and basically, our, our only system of navigation was the sun. It was like telling us, okay, we got to keep going back that way, right? And you guys, we worked it for several hours, kept, kept doing this, kept climbing. And, and we realized we still can't see that thing. We have no idea if we're on the right trail or not. We have no clue. And so we got, I don't know how many hours into this thing, but realized we're not going to make it to the top of Mount Elbert today. So we, we might as well just climb down before it gets dark and we get in real trouble. So we turned around, we went back down the mountain and uh, went back to our car, went back to our campsite. And uh, we we're just kind of going, that was fun, um, lesson learned. And then, and then a couple days later, we, we went into the nearest town and we went to church. Um, We've never been there before. It just, you know, popped in. So let's, let's see what this church is like. It was a wonderful church, friendly people. And as we were standing around talking to people after the service, we told them about our failed attempt to climb Mount Elbert, which was basically in, you know, in their backyard, you know, for these people. And they looked at us and they said, oh, really? Well, what trail did you use? And I'm pretty sure the next sentence out of both of our mouths at the same time was, what? There's a trail? Are you serious? 
I mean, okay, so here's the second thing, which really is the first thing you need to know about climbing a mountain before you start doing it, okay? Find out where the trails are. Because if you follow the trail, you will have a lot less course corrections to make. Makes sense, right? Guess what, folks? There's a trail for your life. Did you know that? Look at the person next to you and say, what? There's a trail? What? There's a trail? Yes, I'm being totally serious with you right now. God has made a trail for your life. He's given you a path to follow in his word, the Bible. And in even more detail, in the life of Jesus. I want you to think about it, folks. It, it totally makes sense. What is our goal? What's, what's our destination? Our, our summit? Isn't it to live forever with God in his kingdom of heaven? I mean, isn't that our ultimate mountaintop? It should be. And if that's the case, that God has given us, first of all, the trail map in his word, the Bible, and he did one better. He actually blazed the trail for us there through the life of Jesus Christ. That's why we follow Jesus. That's why we're Jesus followers, because he's been there. He's done this thing before, and he's shown us how to get where we're trying to go. So if we will follow him, we will have a lot fewer course corrections to make over the course of our lives because we won't be stumbling around like Carrie and I were on our honeymoon on that first day on our own, trying to make it in our own wisdom and in our own strength. Is this making sense? Now, I told you all that as kind of a precursor to today's message, okay? And you'll see what I mean here in a little bit. But first, follow along with me as I read these classic verses on the topic of love from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is one of those areas in our lives that often needs minor course corrections. Let's read together in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clinging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. All right, so a few weeks ago, we began looking into the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And I mentioned then that the apostle Paul was writing this book to the people of Corinth, a, a thriving city in Greece that was ideally situated geographically as both a hub for both land and sea travel. And, and we noted then that the commerce through Corinth at that time would have brought with it a lot of money and also various ideas from around the world, including every type of vice or sinful behavior imaginable. I compared it kind of to our modern idea of Las Vegas. And perhaps one of the reasons that, that Paul felt the need to include this passage in his letter was to combat those love-related vices that would have been prevalent there in Corinth. And here's an example of that. One of the things that Corinth was known for was its temple to the goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Now, this temple sat high on top of a hill called the Acro Corinth. And I think I've got a picture of this in there. All right, so, that, so you're looking from the top of this hill, the Acro Corinth, down into the valley, into the plain area of Corinth, and then out in there to the ocean. So on top of this hill was seated this temple 
to the goddess Aphrodite. And this temple featured about a thousand priestesses who as part of their worship to Aphrodite would every evening descend this hill down into the city and serve the city as prostitutes. So as you can imagine, this had a widespread negative impact on the people of Corinth and all who happened to be there, morally speaking. Most of the people of Corinth had a very distorted view of love. They had a, a worldly view, a view that would never help them get where they really wanted and needed to go in this life. And even in the church, there was confusion about the role of love on their journey and what God's version of love looked like. So Paul addressed this topic in his letter to the Corinthians. And in the first few verses, verses 1 through 3 here in chapter 13, he begins with what almost seems like a warning. Several of the gifts that uh, the pastor John mentioned to us last week and, and even what we're looking at now, so, some of these look like superpowers of the faith. Paul mentions speaking in tongues and prophecy and extreme generosity. But what does he say about all of those things in this passage? He says, if I have any of those gifts or even all of those gifts, but I don't have love, I'm only a noisy, annoying sound. I am nothing. I gain nothing. Did you catch that, folks? You can have the coolest spiritual gifts in your church or even in your whole community. You can have the coolest spiritual gifts out there, but if you don't have love, you got nothing. You're just making noise. You guys, this morning hits really close to me as a pastor because this passage tells me that it doesn't matter how intelligent you are, how educated you are, how powerful or persuasive in speaking you are, or even whether you are appointed or anointed to speak or elected to lead in your church. If you've got love, you're just making noise. I've got to do what I do from a basis of love or otherwise I need a course correction. I'm missing the mark. I've gone off the trail. So what is this love that Paul is so concerned about that he wants us all to have? I'm glad you asked. He spells it out in the next four or five verses, starting at verse four. He says, love is patient. Okay, we're going to stop with this first one get a, and get a few things down. Okay, Paul's going to give us here a definition by description of love. Okay, he's going to define it by describing it. He's going to describe it with a lot of things that it is and with some things that it's not. Like this one, love is patient. So, so if we see, as we walk through these next few verses, if we see these things, these elements in our lives, then we can, we can know that we're probably pretty close to being on track with what God wants for us in the area of love. But if we're walking through, these, through our life and, and in our relationships with God or with people, we are seeing the opposite of these things that we're about to, to go through here, these, these identifiers, then it's probably time for a course correction. Again, using this one as an example, Paul states here, love is patient. So what's the opposite of patient? What is it when you are not patient? You are impatient. Okay, but godly love is patient because God is patient. And if he wasn't, none of us would even be in this room right now because our sins deserve judgment and punishment and he would have just d dealt with it at that moment, at that instant. But God's love is is patient. And if you find yourself prone to being impatient with a certain someone, check your heart. Check your soul. Your love toward them may need a course correction. Okay, let's move on. Love is kind. Did you know that kindness is a choice? I mean, let, let's, let's be fair, okay? You can't control that person who just pulled into your parking spot at the grocery store when it's, it's raining cats and dogs outside, okay? You, uh, mm, anybody ever have that happen? Or at the mall, right? It's like, oh, that was my spot. And the rest of the parking lot is like full. You got to go way to the back and then get soaking wet or freezing in these days, right? So, but, but you can't control them, but we do have a choice to make about how we respond, to that person. And if we go with our natural leanings, our, our first inclination in a, in a situation like that probably isn't kindness. But with the power of God's Holy Spirit within us, we can overcome those first angry 
selfish thoughts and we can choose instead to respond to that person in kindness. That's love. Love is patient and love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Okay, so here are some things that love is not. If you or someone around you is experiencing envy or behaving in a way that is boastful or proud, according to Paul's definition here, that's not love. Envy is an ugly monster. I mean, it will rob you of your joy, your time, your peace, and it will make you bitter and absolutely miserable. And it's that wanting, that, that craving, that jealousy for what someone else has, either their possessions or maybe even their relationships or their character or their personality or maybe even, maybe even their spiritual gifts. But love does not envy slay that beast by rejoicing with those who have good things in their life. That's love. Love does not boast and it's not proud. I I like the way the Daily Study Bible translates these phrases. It says, love is no braggart and love is not inflated with its own importance. Now we probably don't use the term braggart much these days, but most of us recognize someone who is one when we meet them. Right? They're the ones who can't stop talking about all of their great stuff. You know, it might be their possessions or their bank account or their good looks or this or whatever. We can't stop talking about it. That's not love. William Barclay said it this way. He said, true love will always be far more impressed with its own unworthiness than its own merit. Let me read that again. True love will always be far more impressed with its own unworthiness than its own merit. And love is not inflated with its own importance. He also wrote, the really great person never thinks of their own importance. And you've probably met a few of those people in your life. And you think to yourself, that is what a great person looks like and what they sound like. They're not talking about themselves. They're not pointing all the fingers back their way. That's good stuff. Let's press on. Love does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Oh, my friends, (laughs) doing these things come pretty easily for most of us. Uh, Dishonoring someone, uh, which might be poking fun or belittling someone or, or gossiping about them. Love does not dishonor. It's not self-seeking. It it doesn't think of myself first all the time. It thinks of others first. It's not easily angered, or can I stretch it and say, and or annoyed with someone. Ouch. It doesn't keep a mental tally of all the wrongs that person did to me so that I can keep it on file till the next time I see them or come in contact, and then bam, let them have it. That's not love. Those are all things that are easy to do, but none of them reflect love. They're all contrary to the love of God. If we're doing them, we need to make a course correction. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I don't know about you guys, but I tend to get a little bit edgy when I start seeing words like always and never. That makes me just a little bit uncomfortable. Are you kidding me? Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I mean, is that kind of love even possibly attainable by us mere mortals? Maybe, maybe not. But all of these descriptors that we have just covered are part and parcel to the kind of love that Jesus has demonstrated to us, right? Part of the destination of this journey we're on is to reach that perfect love that Jesus has shown to us. That's the kind of love we can expect from our Heavenly Father when we see Him. That's the kind of love we can expect from those other brothers and sisters when we meet them finally face to face in His glory, in His kingdom. That kind of love. And until then we're probably going to have to continue making little course corrections from time to time so we 
take on the kind of love that God wants us to have. Correction is where we put down our worldly definition of love and we take up once again God's definition of love. No, that's not love. This is what love looks like. This is what God says love is. This is the kind of love that Jesus demonstrated. That's my goal. That's my destination. Not this cheap counterfeit that the world is trying to sell me. It's probably going to take us all a lifetime to get there. And that's kind of what Paul conveys in these last few verses today. He said, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it's going to pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what's in part disappears. And he goes on, he says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. My friends, in our humanity, we are only seeing bits and pieces of the character and nature of God through Jesus. The wonder and the glory of who he is is beyond our comprehension. So the best of what we see and experience here on this earth right now is only a glimpse, a copy, a fragment of who he really is, the whole reality. Paul's right when he says, now I know in part, I've got this much understanding of who he is, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Then it's going to make sense. I'm going to get it. At the very end of, of this whole discourse, chapters 12 and 13 of Paul's on spiritual gifts and on love, he makes this statement, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Compared to all those other things he's, he's gone through, faith, hope, and love, all that other stuff is temporary. But these three are going to remain forever. And Paul says, and the greatest one of the three, the biggest one, number one of the three, is love. Now, does God give people in the body of Christ some really cool spiritual gifts? Gifts like prophecy, gifts like healing and speaking in tongues and even working in miracles? Absolutely. He gives people those gifts, and we should celebrate that. He also gives other gifts that, that we don't see quite as, quite as so much as the superpowers. Gifts like hospitality and generosity and teaching and preaching. And to, to others, he gives gifts like helping and compassion and leadership. And all of them are important in and to the body of Christ as a whole. But I, I think what Paul's driving at here, 1 Corinthians 13, chapter 13, verse 13 is this. Those gifts are all great, but without love, they're not enough. They're, they're pretty much pointless. You've got to have that foundation. Followers of Jesus must have love as the foundation of those gifts if we want to do anything of lasting impact for God's kingdom. Now, folks, let's, let's face it, okay? Some people are naturally more loving than others. Raise your hand if you've experienced this to be true, okay? All right? Not, I'm not saying you, but you know, you understand. Some people, you uh, might be your mom, might be your dad, you know, but, but usually we know one parent seems to be more loving than the other, naturally, okay? Not that they don't love you, but they just have a, a natural bent toward that. They're more compassionate, more merciful, more graceful than others. And some people are naturally more lovable than others, even in the family of God, folks, you know it's true, right? That there are some people, even in the family of God, who are just a little bit difficult to love. But let's not kid ourselves. But if we are in Christ, if we are followers of Christ, then at least the seed of his perfect love has already been planted in our hearts and lives. And it's up to us to work with God, to nurture that seed, help it grow, making course corrections where we need as we go. All right, confession, folks, time. Confession time, folks, excuse me. I've still got a long way to go in this department. And let me show you what I mean, okay? If, if we take this passage on love, these, these middle verses here that Paul talked about, and if we, if we take out the word love, and the, the it's that refer to love in this passage, and we replace them with the name of Jesus, then we're going to have a, a pretty good understanding of what love really is. 
and also who and what Jesus really is. That's our goal. That's our summit when it comes to love. Okay, now if, if you will do the same next step of that, of that process and you replace Jesus in each of those situations with your own name or with the word I, and then ask yourself this question, is that statement true? And I've done it here with my name. We can put that up there, okay? So Kyle is patient. Is that a true statement? Uh, sometimes, if I'm being honest, I gotta say sometimes, okay? Um, is Kyle kind? Uh, sometimes. Um, uh, how about this one? Am I, am I self, is Kyle self-seeking? Uh, sometimes. Um, but, so you guys, you got, if you're totally honest with yourself and you work your way through this list, you'll have a pretty good idea right away where you need to make course corrections to get your journey back on track to line your life up with Jesus and the way that he loves. Now, for those of you that are in the house here this morning, you should find a short love assessment tool tucked away there in, on one of the panels inside your bulletin. If not, there should be some more out there on the music stand uh, just outside in the lobby. And my hope is that all of you will take a few moments sometime, either at the end of this service or sometime this afternoon before tomorrow, and you'll walk through that little love assessment and then when you get to the end of it, ask yourself these two questions. How am I doing? What course corrections do I need to make to love like Jesus? Okay, and here's a hint. If you follow Jesus, you will have a lot less course corrections to make. I'm going to go back to my original illustration this morning, the mountain climbing thing. Folks, there are basically three groups of people in this world first group of people are those who are driving around in their little cars totally oblivious to the fact that there is a beautiful incredible mountain behind them they have never seen it themselves they're just doing the best they can to muddle their way through this life they have no clue that there is something better for them and what they need is they need someone to come alongside them and say hey guess what there's a better way you don't have to do life this way. Let me show you that better way. Who's going to do that? Who's going to come alongside them? Who's going to share that with them? There's a second group of people in this world today. They're, these are the people who have come to a point in their lives where they realize there's a better way. And so they have pulled their car off the side of the road as close to that mountain peak as they can, as they can find. And they started making that climb on their own in their own wisdom, in their own strength, doing their best to get there. And you guys, that's a tough road to go, right? They might not ever get there. They need someone to come alongside them and say, guess what? There's a trail. I see that you're trying to get to the summit, right? There's a trail there. Let me show you where that trail's at. It's here in God's Word. And, and Jesus blazed the trail for us to show us what it looks like. Who's going to do that? Who's going to come alongside them and tell them that and show them that, good, that way? There's a third group of people, and I imagine that pretty much everybody else falls into this, which is actually, I'm sure, a smaller group, but it's the, those who have already found the trail and have started up that trail. That's probably most of us here today. And so for those people, I want to give you this word of, of exhortation. Don't do it alone, <laughs> okay? Don't do it alone. That's one of the first things they teach you, mountain climbing and, and hiking. Don't go it alone. And here's why. From a spiritual perspective, if you're trying to do this alone, the enemy loves it when God's people do that because he knows that we are human and we get so easily distracted. I mean, we're going to, following the trail for a little while and all of a sudden, oh, that looks kind of interesting. And we start going that way. And pretty soon we wind up deep in the weeds or worse, in a ravine or a crevice or something that we can't get out of. The enemy knows that if we are alone on this trail, we're easy pickings for a predator like him. I mean, in the real world, it would be predator like a, a bear or a mountain lion, right? Just looking, looking for a, a feast of an individual who's out there by themselves. Don't go it alone. So, when I say that, I say this. Find a group. Find a place to grow. Guess what? 
there's some of those places, I think, in your bulletin today. You can check out some groups that you can plug into. And you can come alongside and encourage and challenge each other to keep growing because it's so much easier to do when you're in a group. You can go so much farther that way. You guys, life is so much better when it's lived in community with a group of people who are going the same way you're going. This year, I want to challenge you guys. Be praying that God will point you to people in each of those three groups. I'm praying he points you to people in each of those groups. And I'm praying also that he will make you attentive to those moments so that you can reach out and maybe you can be the one to show them a better way, to point them to the path, to Jesus, or to encourage them on their next step of their journey. I'm praying that God is going to show you who those people are. I'm praying he's going to bring them to your mind today, the people who are in your lives right now. Because guess what? He wants that ultimate destination for all of us. Let's help him get there. And if you happen to be in one of those first two groups that I mentioned this morning, the ones that are either oblivious or you've just pulled over the side of the road, I, I just want to pray that today would be the day that you would come to Jesus, to the one who has blazed the trail for you, and that you would let him be your trail guide for the rest of your life. Will you pray with me together as we close today? Heavenly Father, thanks so much for this time we can spend in your presence. And God, I pray that you would uh, continue just to pound this message into our hearts and minds as we leave from this place today. God, and that you would be reminding us periodically, every time we step out the door of our house, we're on a journey and there are other people who are on this journey. And God, there's also an enemy who doesn't want us to follow the trail you've marked out for us. So I pray that you would help us to, def to, to make sure that we are walking where Jesus walked, in his steps, following him in, in the areas of love and life. And God, that you would help us to do the same also, to challenge and encourage those around us to the destination that you have pointed us to, God. And we pray all these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus, today. Amen. Amen. Guys, thanks so much for being with us here today. Have a wonderful week. God bless you guys.